Okay, it doesn't want to. There we go. So here are my disclosures. I am here on a volunteer basis and I have no relevant financial conflicts. Uh, these are all the topics I'm going to cover in the next 45 minutes or so. I'm going to explain what cancer is, what the risk factors are, and what the signs of breast cancer are that you can look for. I'm going to stress the benefits of early detection, why you should be screened, and how to increase the likelihood of finding cancer earlier if you do get it. I'm going to go into some detail about what's wrong with the guidelines in Canada. I'll explain what dense breasts are and why it's critical for you to know if your breasts are dense and what you can do if you do have dense breasts. And as we go through, I'm gonna give some recommendations for women who've had cancer and point out some common myths about breast cancer. So starting with the basics, breast cancer is a disease where a group of cells loses normal control. And those abnormal cells grow usually, but not always into a lot. And they invade and damage the surrounding normal tissue. They can spread to other parts of the body like lymph nodes and other organs. But this is something important to know. Breast cancer is not life-threatening when it's just in the breast. It's when it spreads that it can kill. And we can find many cancers before that spread happens. And that's when they can be most easily treated. So who gets breast cancer? Anyone, almost any age. Breast cancer is very uncommon, but still occurs in the 20s and 30s. And even men can get breast cancer, although it's uncommon. About 1% of breast cancers occur in men. So here's myth number one. I sadly sometimes hear from young women that they didn't see their doctor when they found a lump in their breast because they were assumed that they were too young to get breast cancer. And even young women who do see their doctor are sometimes dismissed because the doctor thinks they're too young. And unfortunately, that's not true. You've probably heard that one in eight women will get breast cancer, but that's not uniform across all ages. Risk increases as women age. So the risk for a 20 year old to get breast cancer in the next 10 years is one in 1700. Risk jumps dramatically in the forties for a 40 year old, it's one in 69. That's why we should all have mammograms starting at age 40, especially black, Asian and Hispanic women who tend to get breast cancer younger than white women. Their peak incidence is in the mid forties compared to white women whose peak incidence is in the late fifties and early sixties. Now, there are many other factors besides age that can increase a risk of a woman getting breast cancer above average. Now, some of them are beyond our control, like the list, those listed on the left, like having one of the breast cancer genes, having had chest radiation for lymphoma when you're younger than age 30, having dense breast tissue, of it, as you've already heard, having Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, having a previous biopsy that showed atypical cells. Or if you started your periods younger than average or went through menopause later, or if you had no children. Now, the list on the right is a list of factors you can control to reduce your risk. Minimizing the use of combined hormone therapy after menopause can reduce risk. So can a low-fat diet, minimal or no alcohol, moderate exercise, not smoking, and maintaining a healthy body weight. Now, no one likes to hear about the role of alcohol and breast cancer risk, but you need to hear it. You may be aware of old studies that showed that moderate alcohol intake reduces heart attack risk, but that's myth number two. We've known for some time that even small amounts of alcohol are linked to several types of cancer. The new recommendations are that more than two drinks a week is risky. Some people think that's too conservative, but we do know that three to six, three to six drinks a week increases risk of developing cancers, including colorectal and breast and more than seven drinks a week also increases, increases the risk of heart attack uh, and stroke. So please don't think that a glass of wine every night with dinner is harmless. But if you need more persuading, here's some more information, even just to drink a day increases the risk of a variety of other cancers. It can also damage the digestive system, the liver, the heart, the brain, the immune system. It can leave men impotent and reduce fertility and sex drive in women. Now, it's okay to enjoy a, your glass of wine or whatever your, your uh, drink of choice is as a treat, but it shouldn't be an everyday thing. So here's another myth. Some women tell me that they don't need to worry about breast cancer because no one in their family's had it. And although it's true that the risk of breast cancer is higher in women who do have a family history, especially in a mother, sister, or daughter, women and even sometimes physicians are surprised to learn that 80 to 85% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. That's why all women need to be screened and not just those at increased risk. 
the most significant risk factors for getting breast cancer are being a woman and growing older. And among women diagnosed with breast cancer, dense breasts are more frequent than a family history. So I'm going to speak a lot about dense breasts later. There are tools online to calculate a woman's risk of getting breast cancer. This one is for women who have not had breast cancer, and it estimates the risk in the next 10 years and over a lifetime. It's easy to use with just a few questions, and women with a lifetime higher than 20 to 25% are regarded as high risk. So don't worry about writing down the link. All the resources I'm going to mention in the talk will be available in the recording. Or for this one, you can just type into your... Um, into your uh, internet browser, uh, IBIS risk calculator. So we want to find breast cancer as early as possible, but it would be even better if we could prevent it from happening. Now, if girls followed a healthy lifestyle starting in childhood, it's thought that most breast cancers could be avoided. Even if women wait till middle age to make changes, it's thought that as many as half of breast cancers could be prevented. Walking 30 minutes a day can lower breast cancer risk by 20%. Breastfeeding for a year, and that's all children, not each one, lowers risk by 20%. An overweight woman who loses 10 pounds lowers her risk by 10%. And loss of 20 pounds lowers risk by 50%. Myth number four is that breast cancer always shows up as a lump. Well, it can show up as a lump, but not always. And it's important to remember that most lumps are not cancer. There are lots of other things that can show up as a lump, like cysts and so on. Cancer can show up in many other ways, like as an area that feels firmer than the tissue around it, dimpling on the skin, crust on the nipple, warmth or redness, sores on the skin. Discharge from the nipple isn't always cancer. In fact, if it's white, yellow, or green, it's not suspicious. But if you have discharge coming out all by itself without squeezing, and it's clear like water or bloody, it should be checked. A nipple that's pulled in can be normal, especially if it's been like that for a long time. But if it's new, it should be checked. And if the skin gets thick and dimpled like the skin of an orange, that should be promptly checked. This photo is from a website called Know Your Lemons. It shows some of the ways breast cancer can be manifest. And they also have an app you can have a look at, knowyourlemons.org. So I've covered risk factors, suggestions that might prevent cancer, and how to recognize possible breast cancer when it's visible or feelable. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is early detection of breast cancer before it's big enough to feel or be visible. So we do screening to find cancer earlier, sometimes years before it can be felt as a lump or seen as dimpling. When cancer is found and treated earlier, a significant number of lives are saved. But another important reason to find cancer earlier is so that it can be successfully treated less aggressively than would be necessary if it's detected at a more advanced stage. And that means better quality of life for women with cancer. By less aggressive therapy, I mean the option for less breast surgery, the option for less armpit surgery, and the option to even avoid chemotherapy, all of which improve the quality of life. When cancer is detected later, mastectomy is usually required. But when it's found early, more women can have a lumpectomy instead. Lymphedema is swelling in the arm and hand, varying degrees in this slide here. And it's a common side effect of the traditional armpit surgery done for lymph node staging. It's usually permanent and as you can imagine, life-changing. When cancer is detected early, women can have a less invasive sentinel node biopsy instead with a much lower risk of lymphedema. Women deserve the opportunity to avoid this complication. Now, chemotherapy is challenging to go through, and some women suffer long-term complications. Now, many women can avoid chemo if their cancer is small, if there are no positive nodes, and if they're determined to be at a low risk of recurrence. This is another important reason to find cancers early. And remember, early detection does save lives. Five-year survival drops as the stage of diagnosis is more advanced. The overall five-year survival for stage zero or one cancer is virtually 100%, but it drops as women are diagnosed at later stages. The good news is that 65% of women are diagnosed at stage zero and one, but even with new and better treatments, five-year survival is only 23% when cancer is diagnosed at stage four, and about 6% of women 
are diagnosed at that stage. It's already metastatic by the time it's diagnosed. So there are many different tests that can be used to screen for cancer, and I'll discuss these more in detail shortly. Breast self-exam and clinical breast exam, that's one done by a doctor or nurse, are currently discouraged, but I'm going to explain later why I'm a big proponent of self-examination. Mammograms are the gold standard, and they can be 2D or 3D, but 2D is most often used in Canada, which is unfortunate. Ultrasound is a helpful supplemental test, not instead of, but in addition to mammography for women with dense breasts. MRI is the most sensitive test, but in Canada, it's used for screening only at women at very high risk. Contrast enhanced mammography is an emerging technique that may be useful as an alternative to MRI, but it's not used for screening in Canada. And molecular breast imaging is a nuclear medicine test that's not available anywhere in Canada. But I want you to know thermography has been thoroughly discredited and should not be used for screening. It can find big cancers close to the skin, but it misses smaller cancers deeper in the breast, and it has a very high rate of false alarms. Now, I told you the term breast self-examination has gone out of fashion. Women are told to be breast aware, and they're told to see their doctor if they notice any change. But how's a woman supposed to know if there's been a change if she doesn't know what her breasts usually feel like? And to complicate matters, there's not one normal feel for all women. Some women's breasts feel soft and uniform. Others feel lumpy like a bag of marbles, and some feel very firm. No two women's breasts are identical, but when a woman does her own breast self-exam, she quickly becomes familiar with her normal texture, and she's more likely to notice a subtle change than a healthcare professional who examines more than a dozen women each day, but might examine her only once a year. Now, there are lots of demonstrations of how to do breast self-exam on YouTube, but an excellent one that I recommend is by this woman, Dr. Liz O'Reardon, a breast surgeon in the UK who's had breast cancer. You'll get the link when you ask for the, ask for the uh, recording uh, and you should check it out. It's only three minutes long. And the second link here is her demonstration of how to examine your chest if you've had a mastectomy. Now here's how a mammogram is done in case there's anybody watching who hasn't had one yet. Each breast is compressed twice and only for a few seconds, once from top to bottom, and one from side to side at a bit of an angle. And a low dose X-ray is taken in each position. The compression is uncomfortable, but it should not be excruciating. And it's necessary for two reasons, to spread out the tissue to make cancers easier to spot and to reduce the radiation required to penetrate the tissue. If you're still having periods, try to schedule your mammogram appointment when you're just finishing or soon after your period, because that's when your breast should be the least sensitive. Now, another myth, women with implants can't have mammograms. That's a myth. It's not true. Mammograms are also safe and recommended for women with implants. The technologist takes the usual pictures and then takes pictures with the implant carefully pushed back out of the compression so there's better compression on the woman's own tissue. Now, I know radiation is a concern for some of you, but it's not for experts. The radiation risk from a mammogram is primarily in women less than 20 years old. We don't do mammograms in women that young. And it's negligible after age 40. We're all exposed to natural source radiation every day from the air, the water, and the ground. Natural source radiation is higher at higher elevation. So the dose of a mammogram is similar to taking five transatlantic flights or to the natural radiation you receive living for three to work, three to four weeks in Colorado, or for seven weeks at sea level. And the mortality rate for breast cancer in Canada was unchanged for decades, but starting in 1989, after screening was introduced, the blue line shows how the incidence have, of cancer has fallen off compared to what was expected. And it's been estimated by modeling that there have been 32,000 fewer breast cancer deaths than expected since 1986, which is convincing confirmation of the safety and the, and the success of screening and improved treatment. In this study, they obtained data on almost 2.8 million women attending screening programs in Canada and compared them to women who weren't having mammograms. They showed that overall, women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than those who don't. And women in their 40s are 44% less likely to die. So this shows the importance of starting to have screening mammograms at age 40. Now, unfortunately, only four provinces allow women to self-refer starting at 40, but happily, British Columbia is one of them. Researchers in Sweden showed 
that women aged 40 to 69 who had screening mammograms were 60% less likely to die from breast cancer in the first 10 years after diagnosis and 47% less likely in the 20 years after diagnosis. And there are many other studies that confirm the value of screening in the 40s. But before I go on to the other tests of screening, I want to explain the current guidelines for screening mammography in Canada and how they were made. So these are the current guidelines from some of or the organizations in Canada and the US. And, they, um, and the guidelines to start at age 50 in the US are not in use now because their Congress put a moratorium on them. So they're starting at 40 and most others do start at 40 with some places starting between 40 and 50. But note that the Canadian task force recommends starting at age 50, although they do say in the fine print that it's supposed to be earlier if a woman chooses, but you'll see that that doesn't always happen. These conflicting guidelines didn't arise because of different facts. They arose because of different value judgments applied to the same facts. Annual mammography starting at 40 saves the most lives, and that's recognized even by organizations that recommend starting later or screening less often. And they know that their guidelines will lead to more avoidable deaths. So let's look at this in more detail. We're lucky that in BC, women can self-refer for a screening mammogram without a doctor's requisition. In most other provinces, screening isn't offered until age 50. But even in British Columbia, some doctors discourage women in their 40s from having mammograms, and we do see younger women diagnosed with more advanced breast cancer as a result. So here's why it's important to start at 40. One in six breast cancers, or 17%, are diagnosed to women in their 40s. And cancer grows faster in premenopausal women, which explains why 27% of the years of life lost to breast cancer occur to women who were diagnosed in their 40s. The most years of life are saved when women have mammograms every year starting at 40. Women in their 40s, because their cancers grow faster, need and deserve early detection, and it should be available and encouraged everywhere. They're often caring for young children and aging parents. They're working and contributing to the economy. They have the most potential years of life to lose if they have cancer that's undiscovered until it's advanced, and they're not expendable. Now, in 2016, which was the last time the Canadian Cancer Society published this chart, there were 3,300 women in their 40s diagnosed with breast cancer in Canada. And we know that that number is even higher now because we know that breast cancer is becoming more common in younger women. In Canada, each province makes its own decisions around health, and BC allows women to self-refer starting at 40. So a woman's access to early detection depends where she lives. All provinces and territories allow women with a mother, sister, or daughter with breast cancer to attend annually, but not necessarily starting at 40. Now, there's a website uh, created by Jenny Dale from Dense Breast Canada called mybreastscreening.ca, and women can look there to learn what's offered where they live. In provinces that don't start until age 50, women can and should ask their family doctor or nurse practitioner for a requisition for a mammogram, and they're supposed to provide one. But some GPs and nurse practitioners don't know that, and they refuse to give requisitions. That's where you need to advocate for yourself, and there's help on how to do that on mybreastscreening.ca. We not only need to improve eligibility across Canada, we need to re-educate family doctors to give requisitions to their patients who ask and encourage their patients to participate in screening. And when should screening stop? Well, breast cancer risk increases with age. And if a woman doesn't die of something else, her risk of breast cancer keeps climbing. Now, some regions in Canada stop at age 74, but now many organizations recommend, and I agree, that a woman's in good health with a life expectancy of 10 years, then it's worth continuing screening to find those cancers when they're small. An individual woman's decision to continue screening should be based on her health, her life expectancy, and her values. I have a friend who's 84 and she bought a bike two years ago. She, she rides uh, 10K three times a week. So advocate for yourself and get a requisition if it's required. And please share this information with your loved ones. From Statistics Canada, the average life expectancy for a 75-year-old woman is 13 years. And at age, age 80, it's 10 years. So stopping at 80 would be reasonable, but it depends on your general health and your personal values. The middle column in this graph shows the seven jurisdictions 
where women can self-refer after 75 and happily British Columbia does. The biggest obstacle to optimal screening in Canada is a panel called the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care. They are the federally funded panel that makes screening guidelines in Canada for breast, prostate and other cancers and other health concerns. They publish them in the Canadian Medical Association Journal and they send them to all the GPs and nurse practitioners in Canada. Now with that official name, it should surprise you that there were no breast cancer experts on the panel. You heard me correctly. The panel making breast cancer screening guidelines in Canada had no breast cancer experts. In fact, the chair of the panel that made the guidelines is a nephrologist, a kidney specialist, but there was no oncologist, radiologist, or breast surgeon. In fact, it's in their policy manual. They deliberately exclude experts from participating. And because of the absence of expertise on the panel, they made a number of errors. For example, they did not use the best research they did not use the study I showed you that where 40 to 4% mortality reduction in women's from age 60 to six, sorry, age 40 to 69. And they used only data from, believe it or not, studies done from 1960 to the late eighties that showed only 15 to 20% mortality reduction. And the, even though one of those old studies was badly flawed, they used it anyway. And then they decided that what they called the harms of screening outweighed the benefits. Here are the recommendations of the Canadian Task Force for average risk women. Now these don't apply to women who've had cancer. All women uh, should be able to have annual mammograms, but survivors absolutely should be having annual mammograms and sometimes other tests as well. So for women at average risk who haven't had breast cancer, they recommend not screening in women age 40 to 49. They recommend screening women age 50 to 74 only every two to three years. And that's dangerous because as I've explained, breast cancer incidence is increasing in younger women and waiting two years instead of one gives cancers more time to grow before they're found. And every three years is worse. In BC, women can book their own mammograms only every two years unless they have a first degree family history of breast cancer. The task force also recommends against women do, doing breast self-exam. They recommend against doctors and nurse practitioners doing clinical breast exam. And they say that women with dense breasts don't need any supplemental screening. Now, given that mammograms save lives and improve the quality of life for breast cancer, you might wonder how the heck did they get to these guidelines? Well, I said, as in their estimation, they said the harms of screening outweigh the benefits. Harms? Well, yes. The harm they're most concerned about is the anxiety women experience if they are recalled from screening for more tests. They even make it sound worse than it is by referring to them as false positives. They should call them false alarms or recalls. False alarms happen with all screening tests like pap smears. For every thousand women who have a screening mammogram, about 930 will get a negative result. About 7% or 70 are recalled for additional tests. Now, those recalls certainly cause anxiety, but it is short-lived and it's been shown to be reduced if women are informed ahead of time about the possibility of being recalled. False alarms are common, especially after a woman's first mammogram when we have no priors to compare with, and they're usually not cancer. The majority of those recalled women will only need an additional mammogram. Some will need an ultrasound. 11 of the 70 who are recalled will need a needle biopsy. Now those are done with local anesthetic and I hope those of you attending will um, confirm that I'm going to say it shouldn't be significantly more painful than a blood test. And ultimately of those 11 women, four of them are going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. In this comic, the task force member is standing at the grave and says, yes, regular mammograms and early detection would have saved your life, but aren't you glad we spared you all that anxiety? The task force thinks it's more important to save women anxiety from being recalled, even though more women, including young women, will die. This is patronizing and condescending. Women can tolerate some transient anxiety and should be able to decide for themselves whether they want to be screened and have the opportunity for early detection. The women I see who are the most anxious are those who find out that they have cancer, that it may have spread to the lymph nodes, and that it might have been found earlier. They are anxious and justifiably angry. This chart is from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. You can see that the false alarm rates, the tall blue columns for women in each of the decades 
from the 40s through the 70s are always higher uh, for her first mammogram. And then after that, they decrease. So that's not a reasonable justification to make women wait till age 50 to start having mammograms. The task force recommends that screening start later to spare women transient anxiety, even they know more women will die. Women disagree. Researchers in Pittsburgh found that 97% of women would have regular screening, even if it meant having a false alarm. And 82% of them said that they would ha have no problem having a needle biopsy if it might increase the chance of detecting cancer earlier. In fact, the cutoff age of 50 has no scientific basis as a threshold for screening. Please share this information with your family, friends, and colleagues who are in their 40s. Another risk of screening is called overdiagnosis. Now, it's the theoretical possibility that a woman might die of something else before her breast cancer becomes life-threatening, like heart disease or a different cancer or a car accident. But if we use that as an excuse to not screen all women, we lose the opportunity opportunity to find the cancers that will be life-threatening. The risk of overdiagnosis in younger women is almost zero because they're less likely to have other life-limiting diseases. The task force thinks that around half of all cancers are overdiagnosed, but that's because they base their estimate on that flawed study I told you about that was done in the 80s. Most experts agree that overdiagnosis occurs in 1 to 10 percent and probably in the lower end of that range. And since we can't know whether a woman will die of something else sooner, all breast cancers are treated. Many women are willing to accept screening risks in order to reduce the likelihood of breast cancer death. But women should certainly should be told about false alarms and overdiagnosis. It makes no sense to deny women the opportunity to find potentially lethal cancers to avoid hypothetical overdiagnosis. So if you don't have a crystal ball and you don't know that you'll be killed in a car accident or have a fatal stroke in the next couple of years, mammography is a good bet. When our provincial screening programs don't offer ideal screening, it's not just because they don't want to pay for them. It's because they accept guidelines from a panel who think that women shouldn't have to have some anxiety, even if it increases her risk of dying of breast cancer. And even some people in government don't realize that those recommendations are not coming from experts. So who needs additional screening? Mammograms are important, but they're not perfect. One way they aren't perfect is the false alarms, finding things that aren't cancer like cysts. But another way they aren't perfect is that mammograms don't find all cancers. Women with dense breasts and women who are at higher than average risk, including those with genetic mutations, and breast cancer survivors need other screening in addition to mammograms. So I'm gonna detail some of the tests besides mammograms and I'll explain them in the context of dense breasts. So the best way to explain breast density is with pictures. Dense tissue is the main reason that cancers can be missed on a mammogram. Now this is an obvious cancer on a mammogram and a, a woman who came for screening. Now the picture on the left is the side view, the middle picture is the top view, and then the one on the right is a magnified view of the cancer. And the reason I'm 100% sure that it's cancer is its irregular edges. This one is easy to see because the cancers are always white. And in this woman, the rest of her breast is dark gray. Dark gray tissue is fat. So just remember this cancer for the next few slides. This woman's breast, almost entirely fat and fat is dark gray on a mammogram. We'd, if she had that cancer from a few slides ago, we'd have no trouble seeing it in her fatty breasts. These breasts are normal too, but they have a little more white stuff, not all gray. And the white tissue here is normal breast tissue. If she had that cancer, we'd have a really good chance of seeing it. These breasts are normal too, but they have even more normal tissue. And when the normal tissue is white, we call it dense. It becomes harder to see cancers, which are white, in a background of white. Now, if sheer cancer developed up here, we'd probably see it. But if it was here, we would it would be masked by her normal tissue, and we would miss it on her mammogram. And some women have no fat. Even a large cancer can be missed in this woman. Mammograms miss up to 50% of cancers in women with the densest breasts. Radiologists divide breast density into four density categories, A through D. Now look at these breasts, look how different they look, but they're all normal. They range from all fat to all dense. Both categories C and D are considered dense and A and B are non-dense. 
the denser the breast, the more likely that a cancer will be missed on the mammogram. This video shows that a small cancer easily seen in a fatty breast <clears throat> can be missed in a category C or D breast. And even if a woman has category B, if she's unlucky enough for her cancer to superimpose some of her normal dense tissue, we can even miss it then. You can't tell if you have dense breasts by breast size or touch. Your doctor can't tell by a physical exam. Both fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, firm, or lumpy. Density can only be determined by a mammogram, either by a, by a radiologist or using software. But only 60% of eligible women are having mammograms, so those who aren't can't find out their breast density. All women should be told their breast density in the report they get after their screening mammogram. Dense breasts are normal and common. More than 40% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. But women need to know if they have dense breasts so they can understand the implications. In Canada, there are 3.6 million women over age 40 with dense breasts, and at least 600,000 of them are in the highest density category D. Yet until 2018, no woman in Canada was being told her breast density. Dense Breast Canada is a nonprofit education and advocacy group, and they began advocating in 2017. And thanks to the tireless work of their volunteers, six Canadian jurisdictions now inform all women of their breast density, and BC was the first. Uh, four more say that they will start in 2023. Now, when a cancer is not detected on a mammogram, and it's not found by a woman having her ultrasound, it usually continues to grow and potentially spread. And usually these are found as a lump or other physical change, like I showed you on Know, know Your Lemons, after the woman's last mammogram was negative. And we call them interval cancers because they're found in the interval between planned screening mammograms. Interval cancers tend to be larger and more often already spread to the lymph nodes than cancers detected as screening. They tend to be more aggressive and rapidly growing. And women with interval cancers have a worse prognosis than those cancers found on screening. Now we need to be better at finding cancer earlier in those women, and we can. The biggest risk of dense breasts is the masking of cancers, which leads to interval cancers. But here's the perfect storm. The denser the breast, the greater the risk of getting breast cancer. And we've known since the 1970s that breast density is an independent risk factor for developing breast cancer. Women with the densest breast category D are four to six times more likely to get breast cancer than women with fatty breasts in category A. Or you can say that women in category D are about double the risk of a woman with average density. Having dense breasts is the most prevalent risk factor for getting breast cancer, even more than having a significant family history. Now, not surprisingly, dense tissue also increases the risk of an interval cancer. Women with the densest breasts are 18 times more likely to have an interval cancer. And remember, I said those women have a worse prognosis. The study from the Netherlands confirmed that women with dense tissue don't benefit as much from mammograms as women with fatty breasts. Women with dense breasts who have mammograms reduce their risk of dying by only 13%, whereas women with non-dense tissue reduce their risk by 41%. So it's fair to say that women with dense breasts are discriminated against if they have access only to mammograms for breast cancer screening. Now we can find many of their cancers when they're small with supplemental screening and prevent them from becoming interval cancers. And let's look now at how. So we've known for over 25 years that ultrasound can find many of the cancers that are missed on mammograms when they're still small and haven't spread to the lymph nodes. Our study from 1995 was the first to prove that. I found, uh, I found three cancers per thousand exams, cancers that were missed on mammograms, and many subsequent studies showed the same results. There's now a randomized trial of screening ultrasound being done in Japan. They've randomized almost 73,000 73, women aged 40 to 49 to have either mammograms alone or mammography plus ultrasound. They're finding more cancers in the women having the ultrasounds and the cancers they're finding are more frequently low stage. Most importantly, they've reduced the interval cancer rate by half with only a slightly higher recall rate. BC started covering screening ultrasound with provincial health insurance for women with category C densities, C and D densities in uh, 2019. 
Now that paper I showed you, uh, my paper from 1995, I found three additional cancers per thousand. In the first year since insurance coverage, our clinic's cancer det detection rate was seven per thousand. They were all small and none had spread to the lymph nodes. Some authorities would like to ration screening ultrasound to save money and restrict access to women with only category D or women with a family history. But I want you to know that 40% of the cancers we found were in women with no family history and 60% were women with category C. So ideally all women with category C and D density should have screening ultrasound whether or not they have a family history. Handheld ultrasound like the photo on the left is always used for diagnostic studies. Screening ultrasound can either be done that way or with a large probe like the one you see on the right that automatically scans about a third of the breast. It's called ABUS for automated breast ultrasound. Most clinics outside BC and Alberta do not offer screening ultrasound at all. Right now, the clinic where I work is the only one doing large volume screening ultrasound in BC. Now, any clinic that does diagnostic breast ultrasound should be doing screening, but most don't. And that's partially because wait times for any ultrasound are too long everywhere. But to me, that doesn't mean that women with dense breasts should be shortchanged and denied the opportunity of early detection. If you're category C or D, your doctor should be willing to give you a requisition for screening ultrasound. Compared to other tests, ultrasound is relatively inexpensive. You don't need intra intravenous and it doesn't use ionizing radiation and it uses minimal pressure so it's not uncomfortable. For all these reasons, it has great acceptance by patients. It meets the two important criteria for a test of breast cancer screening. Number one, it finds small invasive cancers that are mostly node negative and it reduces the interval cancer rate. As a bonus, if we do find something on an ultrasound that needs a needle biopsy, it's easy to do the biopsy and guide the needle with ultrasound guidance when necessary. The downside is that some non-cancerous lumps can look concerning, and so they require a biopsy because we want to be better safe than sorry. So now I'll talk about some of the other tests that can find cancers uh, besides ultrasound. Digital breast tomosynthesis, or TOMO for short, is sometimes called 3D mammography. It's not a separate test, it's just a better mammogram. It addresses the two weaknesses of 2D mammograms. It finds more cancers and it reduces recalls. So it's the holy grail. It's rapidly replacing 2D mammography in the US, but it's not used for screening in Canada, except in Alberta and in some places uh, like our office that's participating um, in an NIH sponsored trial. When TOMO was introduced, we hoped that it would find all the cancers we were missing on 2D mammograms and that we wouldn't need to do supplemental screening, but it doesn't. Researchers in Italy compared TOMO with ultrasound and ultrasound detected nearly five times as many additional cancers as 3D mammography. So having 3D mammography does not reduce the need for supplemental screening in women with dense breasts. MRI has been used uh, for women at very high risk since 2007. It finds cancers missed on mammograms and it has the highest cancer detection rate, 10 to 16 per thousand in the first round. It uses no ionizing radiation and it's been pr uh, proven to reduce interval cancers and late stage disease. The downsides are that it requires an IV and claustrophobia is an issue because standard MRI requires about 45 minutes in the magnet. In general, MRI cannot be done in patients with pacemakers and other metal implants. It's very expensive and access is inadequate in most of Canada. This chart shows the cancer yield from mammography, ultrasound, MRI, and various combinations in women at greater than 20% lifetime risk. The highest finding is with mammography plus ultrasound. And the takeaway I want you to see is if you're having MRI, there's no point in doing ultrasound as well. Now there's a faster way of doing breast MRI. Instead of the conventional scan taking 45 minutes, this one requires only 10 minutes in the scanner and it's faster to read. It will make it less expensive and it should make it more tolerable for women with claustrophobia, but it still requires an intravenous. It's important to note though, uh, that it's not a slam dunk that women will be willing to have MRI. There were two large studies of MRI where only 40% of women offered the MRI agreed to have it, even though it was free. And that's because it's not as well tolerated. But as that abbreviated MRI becomes more widely used, that should change because it's faster and will be better tolerated. It'll also bring down the cost for women who have the opportunity to get it done privately. Before you rush out to find a, a private MRI, 
I want to stress here that breast MRI should only be done by a fellowship trained breast radiologist in a facility that does the whole spectrum of breast imaging, including mammograms, breast ultrasound, uh, and uh, ultrasound and MRI guided biopsy. And none of the private MRI places in Vancouver uh, do the other breast imaging. So I've sent people to Seattle if they really wanted to pay for MRI. So who should have screening MRI? Well, the list is likely to change with additional research, but as of now, the United States recommendations are for women with a calculated risk of a lifetime risk of greater than 20%. And that includes women with BRCA mutations, women who had had chest radiation, women who've had previous breast cancer who also have dense breasts, and women of any breast density whose breast cancer was diagnosed younger than age 50. Also, some women who've had a previous biopsy showing atypia or LCIS may also qualify depending on their other risk factors. Now, uh, hot off the press in the last couple of months, the European Society of Breast Imaging has issued new recommendations that all women in category D should have breast MRI, ideally every two to three years, but no less often than every four years. They acknowledge that there aren't enough MRI machines or trained personnel to do that yet. So until there are, they recommend that women who can't get MRI or women who can't tolerate MI, MRI should have mammography and ultrasound. I'm almost there. <laughs> Contrast enhanced mammogram. I didn't get a glass of water ready. Contrast enhanced mammograms are another promising emerging test. It uses a regular mammography equipment, so there's no expensive purchase required. It does require intravenous, and the material they use is the same stuff as we inject for CT scans. The good news is it has a similar cancer detection rate to MRI. It's not in wide use yet, but a number of hospitals across Canada have purchased the equipment. It's also a reasonable alternative to MRI for patients who otherwise would qualify for it, but can't get it or can't tolerate it. And it's fast. Once the IV is started and the contrast is injected, it takes only about seven minutes to take the mammogram pictures. There are a couple of blood tests available, sometimes called liquid biopsies, and some companies are now marketing them to the public to screen for breast and other cancers. The research studies so far are small and incomplete, so please be skeptical. These may eventually prove to be a game changer, but it's too early to judge. The column on the left here shows the jurisdictions directly informing all women of their breast density. And in the four years since Dense Breast Canada has been advocating, they've succeeded in getting the provinces in the middle column to inform only the doctors of their density for all women. The only women being told their density are those in the highest category D. And that's problematic because women in category C who also have dense breasts are being misled into thinking that they don't have dense breasts. That's about 400,000 women on in Ontario. So please consider helping Dense Breast Canada advocate, and I'll show you how later. So what should you do if you have dense? Well, absolutely continue having mammograms because they can detect cancers. Not only that, they can get detect cancers that aren't visible on ultrasound. Do perform regular breast self-exams between screening. The task force says women shouldn't do them, but here's my pitch. Most women in Canada are having a mammogram only every two years, and most women with dense breasts are not having ultrasound. If they get breast cancer, it's often found as an interval cancer. They have a mammogram, it's clear, but at some time later they find a lump. For women with dense breasts who can't get ultrasounds, doing breast self-exam may be the difference between di being diagnosed at stage one or later. Now, ideally all women should do breast self-exam because the majority of women who get breast cancer in Canada aren't having mammograms more often than every two years. Even for women with non-dense breasts, those cancers will be visible on a mammogram, but they might find it smaller before their next mammogram if they do breast self-exam. Why let it grow for two years between mammograms when you might be able to find it earlier when it's smaller? You shouldn't obsess about it and you don't have to do it every month, but just pay a little more attention. You should speak with your doctor about your level of density, the associated risks, any additional risk factors you have, and the best screening options for you. If you do the IBIS risk assessment tool and you find that you have greater than 20% lifetime risk, you may qualify for a referral to a high-risk clinic and be eligible for more supplemental screening. Any woman with category C or D death should, uh, sorry, dense breasts should advocate for themselves to have at least supplemental ultrasound, but be prepared for some pushback and be prepared to have to wait. We recommend that mammograms and ultrasound should not be done at the same time. 
Rather, the ultrasound should be done about halfway between mammograms. So you're getting each test, but being screened more often. And that can help detect rapidly growing cancer sooner. If you find it challenging to get the test you deserve, consider reaching out to your elected representatives. That's how Dense Breast Canada got all the improvements that have come about in the last since several years, women demanding change. So here are the takeaways from this evening. Some cancers are not detectable on mammograms. Most abnormalities on mammograms aren't cancer and women who have mammograms are 40 plus percent less likely to die of breast cancer. The benefits of screening outweigh the harms. Ultrasound finds many of the cancers missed on mammogram in women with dense breasts. And remember, there's two risks of having dense breasts. One is reducing the accuracy of mammography by masking cancers and the act, absolute increase in risk of getting dense, uh, sorry, getting breast cancer when you have dense breasts. It's important to know your breast density and understand these implications. Remember these myths. I didn't have time to go into detail of, about each of them. The myths only happens in middle-aged and older women. False. All breast cancers can be detected on a mammogram. False. You won't guess breast cancer if you have no family history. False. Breast cancer always appears as a lump. False. If a lump hurts, it not, it's not breast cancer. False. But most tender lumps are not cancer. Compression of the breast and radiation from mammograms can cause cancer. False. Breast density doesn't change with age. False. Many women's breasts become less dense as they age, especially with menopause. You can't get screened if you have dense. If you can't get screened if you have breast implants. False. Women with ma with implants can get cancer. They should uh, have mammograms. Optimal mean screening means annual mammograms for all average risk women starting at age forty. No province in Canada does that. Women who are higher than average risk may need to start younger. Women should ideally continue as long as they're in good health with a life expectancy of seven to 10 years. All women should be told their breast density and women with dense breasts should have access to supplemental screening, usually with ultrasound, MRI, or contrast mammography if it's available. As an individual, what can you do? Prioritize your health, find out your breast density. Please let me know. If you know of opportunities for me or my colleagues to speak to women's groups or your elected representatives, educate your friends, family, and coworkers, share this webinar with them, learn more, including how to speak to your doctor about screening on mybreastscreening.ca. And if you've had cancer, please consider sharing your story on densebreastcanada.ca. Don't rush to copy all these resources. Many of the topics uh, that I discussed can be found in this free guide called Your Comprehensive Guide to Breast Cancer Screening. It's free and you can find it on Dense Breast Canada or mybreastscreening.ca. Based on your risk and where you live, you may need to advocate for yourself to get optimal screening. This toolkit offers conversation tips for discussions with your healthcare provider if you're seeking an ultrasound for dense breasts or if you're seeking mammogram in your 40s where they're not offered. There's lots more information as well here on how to advocate for yourself. Finally, if you'd like a recording of this lecture to share with friends and family or to get links to the resources, remember, please type your email address in the chat now, or if you prefer, you can email info at mybreastscreening.ca and Jenny will send you the link. So thank you for your attention. I went a little bit more than I expected. Uh, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. And if anyone has a question they want to ask live, uh, I gather it's, it's going to be okay for you to just uh, raise your hand. There's a bunch of things in the chat, but I don't know how many of them are questions. Karen, are you going to take over and moderate? Um, do you want me to read the chat questions? I saw there were a few. Sure. Um, does does can breast density change from one mammogram to the next? I had dense breast cancer two years ago this year. Mammogram puts me in a B. So yes, breast density can diminish with age. Uh, and if it's going to happen, it's typically around the time of menopause. But because breast density is determined subjectively by a radiologist looking at the film, sometimes even the same radiologist looking at the same film at two different times might grade it differently. We're going to get around that when software becomes more widespread. It's going to calculate it more objectively. But 
um, breast density can go down with age. It can go up, for example, if a woman's not been on hormones and starts taking hormones, her breast density uh, can increase. It's typical, for example, for breast density to be very high during lactation. Um, but those are the reasons breast density can change. But it, so I guess my question is, so if you're like categorized as a B and then, you know, nothing of those changes, like, you know, on hormone therapy, like, like two years later or 10 years later, when you do your next exam, could it become a C or a D? Uh, the only way it would go up if you're not taking hormones or any of those other things I mentioned is if you've lost weight, um, because if you lose weight and some women lose weight off their breasts, guess what they're losing? They're losing the fat. So the proportion of dense tissue, the ratio of dense tissue to fat can go up. Okay. And another question, if a physician refuses to provide a requisition for an ultrasound, are there any options? <sighs> Um, well, some women go to a walk-in clinic. Um, some women uh, point the doctor to um, their website, Dense Breast Canada. The, the other website that I, um, I, uh, I'm on the medical advisory board is an American one. It's called um, densebreast-info.org. And they actually have a subsite for physicians. There's a whole educational program. Um, Jenny, do you want to say something? But you're the advocacy queen. I think you're on mute. Having difficulty um, getting that ultrasound requisition. We do have conversation tips to, uh, that can perhaps help you in your conversation with your doctor. They review what your doctor may say to you with regards to false positives and other reasons they may give, such as there's no evidence that ultrasounds will reduce mortality. And we give uh, some responses to that. I have found personally that just showing that you are educated about the subject can make a doctor quickly write that requisition because they don't want to get into arguments with you and many of them are not informed. So just showing that you are aware and you're willing to advocate for yourself may be all that it takes to get that requisition. And in BC, you're so lucky. Once you have that requisition, anyone in category C or D can get that ultrasound. Okay, and here's one more question is, what is the difference between screening and diagnostic mammogram? Good question. So screenings, when, uh, when a woman's not having any problems, she uh, has no lumps that she knows of, and she's just being checked to see if there's a cancer that, that isn't apparent. Uh, a woman who has an abnormal screening mammogram is then sent for a diagnostic mammogram where we've already got the four basic pictures that we start with and we, we do whatever additional pictures are necessary. Sometimes there are pictures at different angles. Sometimes they're... Um, magnification pictures. Um, but if a woman has a lump or a problem like discharge, um, then she doesn't go for screening. Then she goes for a diagnostic and a diagnostic mammogram starts out with the same four pictures as a screening mammogram, but then you take it from there. Hopefully on the, uh, on, on one visit, they get everything done that they need. And a lot of people don't have their screens on, so I won't be to see if anyone has a question, but if you want to just raise your hand through that, that um, at the bottom, you can raise your hand or, uh, okay, I see Mary Ellen, yeah. Dr. Gordon, I uh, have had regular mammograms for years and years. Um, I'm now 72 and uh, in the last one taken in 2022, I was, uh, given the rating, and I fall into the C category, which didn't surprise me at all, actually. I, I actually sure. thought that the actual feel of my breasts meant that I was had dense breasts, but you're telling me it, it's not. Anyway, um, what we seem to have done in terms of a protocol is that my doctor has said, uh, I would prefer that rather than doing uh, your mammogram biannually, you should be doing it annually. And uh, every one of those will be followed up with an ultrasound. Well, um, <laughs> that, I mean, I, I wish all women could have a mammogram every year, but the screening program won't let women come every year. The screening yeah. program, when you call to book, they know when your last one was, and they're not allowed to give you an appointment before two years. Uh, if the doctor writes a requisition for a diagnostic, um, and there's really nothing wrong if they don't, some, some doctors will fudge it a little bit and say, you've got a problem and get you in for the diagnostic. 
But then if the screening program didn't used to be able to do this in the last couple of months, they now have the ability to see when that diagnostic was. And if you try to book a mammogram a year later with them, they're going to say, no, you had a mammogram a year ago. You have to wait two years. Uh, I, I, don't take- quite know, I don't quite know how she's rationalizing it. She might even be saying she has dense breasts. But for whatever reason, I seem to be getting the breast mammogram and the ultrasound. Uh, okay, the only women that the, our screening program, our screening program will let come every year are women who have a mother, sister or daughter with breast cancer. And if you, the screening, pro, uh, my understanding is if, if your doctor's giving you a requisition for a diagnostic, great. I mean, the, let everybody in the, let everybody on this webinar see if that works for them. But uh, unfortunately, the family doctors are sort of um, I don't want to use the word brainwashed, but that's pretty close, uh, blitzed by the task force who say that women don't need a mammogram every year. Yeah. Well, I think that I think that once it became clear that I had dense breasts, that the whole the whole picture changed. And you're lucky because, you know, as I said, 43 percent of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts. And believe me, they're not all having an annual mammogram and most of them aren't having an ultrasound either. So it's fantastic that your doctor knows as much as they do. Um, I do speak to family doctor organizations as often as they'll let me. Um, there are, uh, the you know, the, the doctors who are uh, working in the private family practice situations like um, TELUS and Harrison Health, um, they tend to be better educated about these um, proactive preventive uh, situations, but the average family doctor is not. And you're just so lucky to have that family doctor. But I, but I guess for, for like, you know, someone in Mary Ellen's case, if you're all of a sudden become a C or a D, would you recommend like even every two years plus an ultrasound? Like they go to, they should go together to, even if she can only book it every two years, but still get the ultrasound with it. No, she, I say the ultrasound in the in between year. Yeah. Oh, so get it. Oh, that's a good idea, Mary Ellen. So get ultrasound one year and mammogram yeah. when you're allowed to. Yeah, but if her two. doctor's if her doctor's getting her a mammogram every year, go for it. Yeah, I mean, if you can it. do it, but yeah, but a minimum would be ultrasound one year, and that that's a good idea. Mammogram one year. There's actually another question. Could you please explain what is calcification? Does its existence is its existence alarming or the shape, I don't know, alarming or the shape size? Yeah. Okay, so calcification is bits of calcium like our bones are made of that are very, very common in the breast. Um, there are calcifications, for example, the most common non-cancerous lump in the breast is called a fibroadenoma. And they frequently develop calcifications as they age, as the lump ages. But some cancers also have calcifications. Sometimes calcification could be the the only sign of an early cancer. So when we see calcification in the breast, we analyze it very uh, significantly. We do those magnification views that can show us the shapes of the calcifications, the individual shapes, but also the alignment, how they line up together. And based on how they look, uh, if we think they're... uh, is even a small possibility that they might be a cancer, then we recommend a needle biopsy. So they won't be at, so that calcification won't necessarily be an abnormal shape, which would be a normal shape, then you wouldn't worry about it. But it's when there's abnormal shapes is when you think maybe cancer. When we look at calcifications on the mammogram, there are lots that we're 100% sure are not cancer. And there are some that we're 100% sure that they are cancer. And then there's the in-between ones. And for the in-between ones, we have a very low threshold for recommending a biopsy. Okay, I think Lorraine, were you going to say yeah, something? Um, I wanted to know if you're on uh, hormone tablets, um, does that give you less chance of getting breast cancer? So it's thought that short for women who take hormones for menopausal symptoms, that yeah. short-term use, like five to seven years, is safe if you start at the time of menopause let's say a woman goes through menopause at 50 and she goes on hormones at 60. No, that's not safe. And longer than seven years, um, it's a balance of benefit and risk. The risk of heart attack, stroke, breast cancer, and blood clots increases. So if you, if you, your quality of life is, is terrible, not on hormones, 
then you take them, but you have to be very well aware of the risks and certainly uh, do everything you can to minimize the risks of all those other things. Make sure you're at a healthy body weight and you're exercising and, and you, your cholesterol is okay and your blood pressure is okay. But five to seven years is felt to be safe. Thank you. Okay, Kayla? Kayla, you're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. This is just so informative and so incredibly helpful. My question is regarding the MRIs with contrast dye, you said should be done at a breast radiology clinic only. Does that also apply to the ultrasound or can an ultrasound be done really anywhere? Uh, so we're talking about screening ultrasound as opposed to a well, woman with a so well, with somebody with dense breasts like myself. Okay, so you you want a screening breast ultrasound. You it should definitely be done in a facility that is very experienced at doing breast ultrasound. So that typically would be in the setting of where there's a mamma, mammogram uh, and ultrasound department, and it should be in a well. That's not quite true. So if a woman has an ultrasound and it's negative, that's great. If she has the ultrasound and there's something iffy and they want to do a needle biopsy. Not all clinics that do the ultrasound do the needle biopsies, but you have to go to a clinic where if they find something, they will arrange for you to have the biopsy somewhere else. For example, on the North Shore, uh, North Shore Medical Imaging does breast ultrasound, but if they're going to, if the woman needs a biopsy, they want it done in the hospital. And that's just uh, because of the uh, pay situation. Um, if, if a woman at, there's a big group called uh, Brooke Associates, uh, that have uh, offices in uh, Burnaby, Delta, and Richmond. If you have an ultrasound in their office and you need a biopsy, you go to one of those hospitals. So not all clinics, private clinics, uh, sorry, I'm not supposed to call them private anymore, community clinics, um, mm -hmm. do the biopsies. Okay, there's a couple That's more. Good. Oh, sorry. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. There's a couple more questions. Um, can fibroadenomas disappear? I had two when young at 19 years old and then they're gone now. They can shrink over time to the point that they disappear. And even if they um, aren't any smaller over time, they can, I, in, when you see a fibroadenoma and an ultrasound, they're usually a little bit darker gray than the normal tissue around them. And uh, over time they can become the same shade of gray so that we can't see them anymore. Okay, and then is occasional discharge from the same breast normal if clear or slightly yellow? I think you went uh, over that. The kind of discharge that we worry about is the spontaneous discharge. Um, if it, it, there's some women who, at one point they, they taught women to do breast self-examination and to include squeezing the nipple to see if discharge came out. But it's normal to get discharge if you squeeze. So. They stopped teaching that a long time ago. And of course, now nobody gets taught how to do breast self-exam anyway. But if the discharge is coming out all by itself and it's clear, clear like water, it should be checked. If it's white, yellow, or green, and it's, you know, it's a who cares. But if, um, but if it only comes out when you squeeze, even if it's bloody, it could be because you're traumatizing the, the tissue and making the blood come out. Okay, and you kind of went over this, but why is uh, breast screening stopped at age 74? So the, our task force, that's a whole other hour lecture. This task force, because there are no breast experts on it, they made the decision that the only trials that they were going to use to determine the benefits of mammography are the so-called randomized control trials that were done from the 1960s to the late 1980s. Those trials only included women up to age 74. So because, because that's just how they did them in those days. So what they say today is we have no evidence that screening after 74 is, is beneficial. It's not because it isn't beneficial. It's because the old studies didn't show that it was beneficial. But we know that when we find cancers early, regardless of a woman's age, she's able to have less um, aggressive therapy. So I've even, for example, we find a, a, a lump in a elderly woman who's in a nursing home. We want to know if it's cancer, because if you leave it there, it's going to eventually erode through the skin. It's going to be a wet nursing headache. 
And if we find out it's cancer and they can do a little lumpectomy, even under local, you've improved that woman's quality of life. So we don't say to screen all women. You know, like I said, they have to be in good health with a life expectancy of 10 years. And as you saw, women at 75, now at 75 is the new 55. Seven, life expectancy <laughs> at 75 is 13 years. Go for it. Have your mammogram. So will, will BC allow you, though, to book a, once yes. you're over 74? They will. BC Yes, up to, I think it's up to 79. And after okay. that, you can still go. You just need a doctor's requisition. Uh, okay. I was once, uh, I, I was once, um, I was looking at my schedule of the, the biopsies. This goes back a long time. And I saw that there was, I think she was 95 years old on the schedule for a needle biopsy. And yeah, it looked like a cancer, but I phoned her family doctor and I said, I, I see Mrs. So-and-so is coming for a needle biopsy is this appropriate? And the doctor said, have you met her yet? And I said, no. he said, just wait. So I went in the room and she was full of beans and I'm doing her biopsy. And she said, Dr. Gordon is okay. If I travel tomorrow, I said, yes, where are you going? She said, my son in Montreal is having an operation. I have to go take care of him. So, you know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, there's one more question, which again, you went over, but how do we found, find out what our breast density is? I guess I, I personally didn't know. I'm going to go look back at my breast. Cat. Like I just had one a few months ago. I didn't even know to look. So it oh. must be written in there somewhere. If you had a screening mammogram, this is, yeah. this was started in October, 2018. Since then, every screening mammogram has said your category A, B, C, or D. Yeah. I probably didn't know what it meant. I never, I just kind of skim over it. Yeah. And well, it starts with, you know, we're happy to tell your mammogram was negative. The, yeah. uh, the, that's, uh, that's as far as I go. <laughs> the screening program uh, did this under duress. They did not want to tell women their density. It was really because patient advocates um, spoke to their MLAs. Um, in particular, Jenny's co-founder and I went to Victoria. Uh, I had approached the NDP to let me speak to the women's NDP caucus and kudos to her. Um, what's her name, Jenny? Joan? Janet Rutledge. Janet Rutledge said, I'll do better than that. I'll have you speak to all the women MLAs of all the parties. Completely nonpartisan. They ganged up on Adrian Dix and he ambushed our screening program to make them tell women their density. So what happens is you get you're told your density, but then you get an information sheet that downplays the significance of breast density. So we're, women have to know. This is, why, this is why I do this. This is why I vol volunteer my time. I want all women to know. Read the report. Find out. Do something. Find that or yeah. Lorraine? Oh, I, I did it. I uh, filled out an actual form to say that I want my breast density to be done and the next year I said do I need to fill out that form and they said no it's done automatically now Jenny's and that was quite a few years ago when we first got started advocating Jenny's co-founder Michelle Di Tommaso was giving out those forms in grocery lines and and it was her talking to the MLAs it was her talking to media and they got so overwhelmed by women like you sending in the forms they finally said <laughs> it'll this is taking too long. It'll be faster if we just tell all women. That's how it happened. And there's there's just a follow up on that. If you've lost your report or if you don't have access to your on my health, I guess, dot bc dot um, ca. Yeah, can you call the mammogram people? Would that they probably won't tell you over the phone. I bet not. Your family doctor has a copy. They'll oh, leave. your family doctor. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Yeah. yeah. And the last question here is, is hereditary only maternal or can it be paternal as well for hereditary? Absolutely paternal. So if your father had breast cancer, it's the same risk to you as your mother having had breast cancer. If your father's mother had breast cancer, that's the same risk as your maternal grandmother. But in British Columbia, they only let you go annually if it's a first degree relative family history, mother, sister, or daughter. I see another hand up. Oh, Evelyn? Yes, um, I meant uh, mother-in-law, like from uh, like from my husband's mother. If she had cancer, could our daughter have it or her son? Um, yes, but probably not as high risk. Okay. Um, 
But, you know, like I said, everybody should go annually. So she okay. should definitely start when she's 40 if she hasn't yet. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? That's it. That's it from the chat line. Great audience. Thank you, everybody, yeah. for hanging in so late. Well, it's not that late, 8 30 here. <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, Paula. That was so informative. Yeah, I learned thank a you. lot. Like here I thought I knew something that I've really learned a lot. And um, it was really unbelievable um people have written this is most valuable zoom thank you for agreeing to talk to our group like it's really and it, you talked at a really good pace and at a good level i think it was phenomenal yeah thank I, you I, thank my, you so much my offer was genuine if any of you are involved with any women's organizations so for example i'm speaking to law firms and and investment companies and just to get the word out so if any of you have any connections uh, uh, you know, let them know that I'm happy to do this. And it's, uh, it's a volunteer gig. Thank you. Now you're getting lots of kudos in your chat money. You can read them after. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. Paula. Okay. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good Thanks, night. Paula.